Um, well, happy International Day of Peace, everyone. I thank you very much indeed for inviting me to this event. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to be with you all this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let us first of all remember our dead, the UN people who passed while serving to achieve or protect peace around the world. Later today in New York, the General Assembly will be celebrating the life of former Secretary General Kofi Annan, who passed away suddenly in August. Actually, he fell sick when we were together in South Africa celebrating the centenary of uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, another memorial will take place in Geneva on Thursday, the 27th of September, which I hope to attend as a member of the elders of which Kofi Annan was the chair. If I am not mistaken, the first personality to die violently while working for peace was Count Falk Bernadotte who was assassinated in Palestine in 1948. The other noted victim was, naturally, his Swedish compatriot, Dag Hammarskjöld, who died in a plane crash in what is Zambia today. Uh, then, it was then the northern Rhodesia in September 1961. Until now, as you all know, it is not clear if the death of the most celebrated UN Secretary General was due to an accident or sabotage. Let's also remember Sergio Vieira de Mello and his more than 22 colleagues, victims of the unspeakable terrorist attack on the 19th of August 2003 in Baghdad. And let's remember also Hadi Annabi and his, uh, in, uh, uh, who died in the earthquake in Haiti uh, in 2010, together with 81 other UN members. We are recalling the UN's own victim, but we do not forget that uh, in that earthquake and elsewhere, countless other people have died, the victims of wars that the United Nations try to stop to establish peace. Uh, there are, of course, you know, all those countless friends that we uh, want to remember uh, today. I congratulate you at UNESCO for the impressive book, Long Walk for, of Peace, you have produced, and I thank you for sending me a copy. It sums up beautifully with the uh, much of both what the UN stands for and what the UN does to achieve and protect peace around the world. As I think you want this event to be an interactive affair, uh, there are many other speakers who are more learned and much more up to date than I am. You know, I retired quite a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll just say, say a few words about what we call international community when we speak about uh, peace and war and how to make peace and how to stop war. Uh, I will then uh, speak of uh, uh, you know, two or three, I'll make two or three points. At least two will be a little bit controversial, but that will, I hope, make it interesting for the discussion. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it is quite uh, fitting that uh, the first sentence in your book uh, is borrowed from uh, Mahatma Gandhi and reads, the world will be at peace only when the individuals composing it make up their mind to do so. Kofi Annan puts it a little bit differently. The peacemaker cannot want peace more than the parties to the conflict themselves, he used to say. Uh, he and I, uh, after him, tried to help uh, the Syrian parties and others involved in that horrible situation, directly or indirectly, uh, to end the conflict there. Our simple proposition was that there was no military solution in Syria 
and that all parties had to work together to forge a political solution and a new dispensation for Syria. It took a long time to get everyone just to pay lip service to our proposition. But all the while, they were saying that they agreed there was no military solution. But most of them, perhaps all, were working for war, not for peace. We convinced neither the Syrian parties nor the so-called international community. And this is, you know, who is the international community? It's not the, all the members of uh, the UN. In every situation, the international community is different. The international community that counts is composed of the parties that have interests and influence. Uh, so when you speak of Syria, uh, little Lebanon, uh, little Jordan, uh, Hezbollah are much more important than uh, Brazil or South Africa. So we have got to remember of the fact that this is, uh, this is the international community that is the international community that need to be more mobilized together, along with the local parties, if a genuine peace process <clears throat> is to be achieved. This point is of paramount importance to be kept in mind when, when crafting a mandate, and that is my second point, for a UN peace operation. In most cases, the mandate for a UN operation is put together in a hurry when neither the Secretary General nor any, anybody knows really uh, uh, what, is, what is happening in the country which we want uh, to help. Just look at South Sudan. The UN mission was designed to help a country gaining independence to construct the state and build its economy. But from day one, what they faced was not the construction of the state, but the destruction of the state and they are still engulfed in that uh, situation. Or remember Darfur. How can a hybrid mission, as the one that existed there, with 10,000 uh, men, uh, strong mission, poorly trained and equipped, provide uh, uh, protection to the civilian population in an area that is larger than, than, than France, and without, of course, the infrastructure that exists in, 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 in France. I'm glad the HIPPO report has suggested that the Security Council will first issue a provisional mandate and then a second, more comprehensive one, when the mission knows a little more about what we'll be facing, what, what it will be facing. My third point is about elections. Uh, elections are important, necessary, indispensable, but all, they will do the, the, the good expected of them only if they happen at the right time. Unfortunately, quite often we organize elections too early. So, and that is why I'm saying now elections should, be not, should not be organized as early as possible. They should be organized as late as possible in, in, in a process and perhaps we can we can talk a little bit more of that. Uh, now, my, 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 what I believe may be a, a bit uh, controversial. I think we all know what R2P is, responsibility to protect. Uh, it's a brilliant formula that was found by the co-chair of the commission that uh, made the report about the subject, which was shared by two remarkable men uh, Gareth Evans from Australia, and Mohamed Sahnoun, my compatriot, who, by the way, passed away yesterday. Uh, to speak of the responsibility to protect, responsibility to protect, is so much better than speaking about the uh, droit à l'intervention humanitaire. It is, it is much better. But uh, as you know, it has been employed, it has been used specifically in resolution 1973 about Libya. And a lot of governments, including those who have voted it in the Security Council, consider that the, the, that resolution has been abused. And therefore, I think the very idea of uh, uh, responsibility to protect is compromised. And my question is, 
uh, shouldn't we, rather than speak of the responsibility to protect, you are talking not about the people who need protection, you are talking about the people who provide protection. Who, who will provide election? It will be the rich, the powerful. Uh, why don't, not, don't we speak about the right to protection? Then you will be speaking about the people who need protection, and you can discuss how that protection uh, will, will, uh, will be provided. The last point is about the International Criminal Court. I mean, let me say from the outset that uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very critical of this institution, but not in the way that you have heard a few days ago from some rather important countries, who, by the way, are not members of the, of the, of the Rome Statute, are not party to the Rome Statute. The Rome Statutes have been are a remarkable achievement. It's great. We need an international court. But I think the... the the nature of uh, the uh, idea has been perverted profoundly uh, these, last, uh, these, la these last few years. First of all, the United States has been able, first of all, the United States has unsigned the protocol. They, not only are not, they are not party, they unsigned. They don't want to hear of, uh, of the international court. And then you have you know, uh, America, India, China, Russia, who are not members of this court. That's about half the, 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 the world population. Justice, the fundamental basis for justice is its universality. Uh, a, a, justice, a court of justice that is not, uh, that will not, uh, that is not uh, accepted by half of the population that is concerned is, 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 at, is uh, I mean, has, 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 has a problem. And then the United States, as you know, has been able to get bilateral agreements with 100, more than 100 countries who said that uh, no American citizen will be uh, uh, you know, arrested uh, on, on the basis of a, a request from the International Court. So I, I think that the, the court needs to be, uh, to be reviewed, to be, uh, I mean, we need to do something to, 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 make it, to make it a little bit more universal. Otherwise, I think it will be, it will be in, 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 serious, in serious trouble. Kofi Annan uh, was a very strong supporter of the ICC. I, ICC. Uh, he criticized publicly those African countries who were threatening to withdraw from, from the court. Uh, we had countless discussions, he and I, on this subject. And uh, I think he thinks that it can be, it can be amended rather than abandoned. Uh, I hope he is right, and I hope that we can, we can amend it. I thought I would make these five points just to uh, start the ball rolling, and I'll be very happy to listen to the others. I'm sorry if I have been a little bit longer than I thought. Thank you very much indeed.